one. Oh my gosh, we have such an amazing show that's going to be going on today. Uh, we have an ex or former CIA operative here with us, and he's actually turned into a master healer with uh, Spring Forest uh, Qigong, which is a form of healing movements. But, you know, I'm a, a lot of people out here have never met or uh, a CIA agent, so... You know, they have a wider perspective on what's going on in the entire world, how these in how, you know, what the planet and everything, because they're one of the things that they do is they gather information and see how it clicks together and everything. And then how do you apply that to the healing movement in order to make the planet a better place and humanity, mankind a lot better? So this is one of the things that we're going to be covering here with um, Han K. Lee and um, also on board tonight we also have michael um chiktowski he's with um he's a herbal um per, uh, herbal acu and also acupressurist acupuncturist and he's going to assist me in questioning han k lee and i'm just so excited today to see me yet and, you know i'm just wow man so this is definitely going to be cool all right that's today on health awareness talk thank you Hello everyone, my name is Malik L. Train, Certified Fitness Trainer, Certified Hypnotherapist, also Certified Reiki Master. Uh, today we're going to be interviewing and having a talk with uh, Seafood um, Han K. Lee. Um, he's an XCIA operative and also a master spy um, that's turned into a master healer through Spring Forest Qigong, which is dealing with different healing elements. Also I have um, to help to question him is um, Michael Chitowski. Uh, he owns his own herbal shop and he's going to tell us a lot more about that and I'm going to go ahead and introduce and he also has been studying Tai Chi for like 30, 20, 30 years and he's also an acupuncturist as well. Michael, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, I'm Michael Chitowski. I live in Northern California, Redding, California and I have a Chinese herbal business called East Earth Trade Winds and it's found on the internet at eastearthtrade.com but I've been selling Chinese herbs nationally and internationally for about 30 years, trying to promote um, health and awareness um, through Chinese herbs. I got my training in herbs, actually, from going to acupuncture college and have been licensed to practice acupuncture for about the same amount of time. And I have a clinic here in um, Reading called Reading um, Acupuncture Healthcare. And um, we... We have a pretty busy clinic and see a lot of people and once again trying to promote the um, Asian Oriental healing arts and um, preventative medicine. Wow, that is definitely super, Michael. Okay, um, Han, how about yourself? Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself because um, in your book, uh, you went scholar, warrior, spy, teacher, healer. Man, you're just a renaissance man, aren't you? I don't know about that, Michael, but first of all, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to be here on your show. And I want to thank Michael for coming on also. Uh, we, Michael and I, I think, share some of the same paths because I got into Chinese medicine uh, kind of late in life. Uh, I started off growing up in New York's Chinatown, 
uh, on the rough streets of Chinatown, and I had to take martial arts in order to defend myself because I was getting bullied so, so much. Then I joined the Marine Corps to try to prove myself. But the horrors of war made me realize the futility of war, and I looked for solutions on how to achieve peace. I thought I'd join the CIA because the CIA would offer me a chance to provide policymakers with information that we could uh, use to avoid war and to avoid squandering our national treasure. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, good intelligence doesn't always translate into good policy. So, but I did have a chance to travel ar around the world and learn quite a few things. But in the course of my uh, travels, I realized that my my real goal in life was to be of service to others. And so I chased my childhood dream of studying Chinese medicine and practicing acupuncture. And so that's what I'm doing now. I'm sticking people uh, needles in people to try to help them. And in the process of doing that, I learned that one of the most powerful healing modalities is, is Qigong. And so I studied Qigong with uh, Master Chuni Lin, who created Spring Forest Qigong. And as you mentioned, I wrote a memoir recently called uh, Paths Less Traveled of a Scholar, Warrior, Spy, Teacher, Healer. And it's my way of introducing people to Chinese medicine, sort of in a sneaky way, but what can you expect from a former spy, right? right. I wanted to hope people <laughs> on the uh, on the spy story, stories, because no one can resist a good spy story, right? Yes, all right. And in the last, actually the last chapters of my book, I, I describe the benefits, the healing power of Chinese medicine and Qigong. Mm. That's my story. All right, that's um, absolutely super. What was that healing exercise, growing fingers thing you were telling us about? Oh, yes. You know, one of the things that is very powerful is the mind. The mind can do a lot of things to either help us or to impede. So let's all try the uh, fingers growing game. Have you heard of this fingers growing game, Malik? I, I've heard about it, never actually practiced it. Okay, let's all try this. Even the uh, people who may not see us on the video, but they can hear us. I want everybody to uh, put their hands together so that they... You have two wrist creases, right? At the bottom, at the base of your palms, there's a line, there's a crease. I want you to carefully line up those creases and then extend your fingers and your hands so that both hands and fingers match. So that one hand is usually always uh, with fingers longer than the other. To measure your fingers and see which hand has a shorter finger. Have you got that, Malik? Yes, sir. Uh, Michael, have you have you tried that? Um, I'm doing it right now, and uh, my right hand fingers are shorter than my left. Okay, whichever hand has the shorter fingers, including all those people in our radio audience today and watching us in video, hold up the hand with the shorter fingers. Hold up the hand with the shorter fingers and drop the other hand. Drop the other hand. Now I want you to close your eyes, close your eyes and imagine that your fingers are getting longer. They're getting longer and longer still. They're growing into giant, giant fingers. Giant fingers longer, longer and longer. Now I open your eyes and again measure your fingers. Match up the base of your palms where the wrist crease star is and then match them up and stretch your fingers out. Now, what happened? Did the shorter fingers get longer? Yes. Malik? Mine did. How about you, Michael? Um, they seem to be about the same right now. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right, now hold up the same hand again. Hold up the same hand that, and uh, close your eyes. Now fingers back to normal, fingers back to normal, fingers growing back to normal. Now measure your hands again. 
Now, what happened there? Did your fingers grow back to normal, Malik? Mine did. Michael? It sure did, yeah. That's interesting. I like okay. that. Okay. Now, uh, for those of you in the audience, if your fingers didn't grow back to normal, you'd have to get new uh, glove sizes. <laughs> now, let's try it with the other hand. Try it with the other hand. We're going to measure our hands again. Yeah, hold them up and be sure to line up the base uh, uh, wrist creases of your palm. Stretch them out so the uh, other finger, the other hand with the longer fingers, right? Mm -hmm. I want you to hold that hand up. Hold that hand up. Hand down. Close your eyes now. Imagine that your fingers are getting shorter. Getting shorter, shorter, and shorter still. Shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Now, hold up your hands again and measure your fingers. Now, how about that? Did your fingers get, sh did the hand with the, you huh. held up, the fingers get shorter? Yes, and if anybody out it did, there, yeah. yeah, it did. Anybody out there um, listening to this on radio, if it does happen for you, uh, please send us in your input on um, on sirbroadcast.com. <laughs> that is funny. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well let's 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 put that hand uh, up again because we don't want you to have uh, uh, short yeah. fingers. Uh, okay, hold that hand up again. Close your eyes. Fingers growing back to normal. Back to normal, back to normal. Now measure it again. Measure your hands again. All right. Are they back to normal? Yes. All right. Yeah. Michael? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes, they are, yeah. Now, what that exercise does, it illustrates the power of the mind. The mind and the, our energy of the mind can change our physiology. So my question to you and the audience is, what are we telling ourselves every day? Mm -hmm. Are we telling ourselves that, you know, we can't do something or I'm ill, I'm sick, I'll never get better? Or are we sending the correct messages to our bodies? Mm. Okay. That's the power of Qigong. Wow, that is absolutely super. Hey, Michael. Michael. Yeah. Yeah, remember we yeah. were talking with Yachty um, on a, a, a last program that we did on creating the ultimate athlete of Eastern perspective. And Yachty was telling us that uh, Chi Kong was uh, actually greater for him than uh, acupressure and also with the food and um, herbology and herbs and stuff. Remember that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's what he said. He said that he tried, I believe he said he had even tried acupuncture and well, all the other doctors too, but it was Qi Gung that really made the, the incredible differences in his health for him. Yeah, that was right. What's your take on that, um, Han? Well, I'm glad you mentioned athletics. Uh, I think a lot of trainers now, whether you're playing golf or tennis or you're a boxer, uh, trainers realize the power visualization in Chinese medicine we, we say we have a saying where the intention goes the chi follows mm -hmm. so uh, our intentions and our way the way we can visualize things will will help our bodies uh, react uh, much faster and quicker so we can actually optimize uh, our athletic performances by uh, doing things like uh, qigong and visualization and visualization is an important component of chico. Mm hmm Yeah, that def visualization. So I mean, just basically, because you got to play, you got to pay money money for herbs, and you got to pay money continually for the acupuncture. Uh, so you got a choice between you got a illness, and you got only three modalities that you can use. You can either use um, you can either use herbs, you can use acupuncture, or you can use uh, qigong. What you going to use on? Well, I don't think it has to be an either or. I think qigong is something that anybody can do, and it doesn't require any money or time or um, having to see people because it's a pillar, actually a pillar of Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. So qigong and Chinese medicine, which includes acupuncture and herbs and the other pillars of Chinese medicine, including uh, massage and trainna and nutritional therapy, mm -hmm. they all same, uh, share the same foundation and the same theories. I, I think 
Michael can back me up on that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah, that's actually see that kind of you know that's why I wish Yadi was still on the phone because uh, that's who was telling um, the, uh, was on the show tonight was because Yadi was telling me basically he said well Chi Kung is all that I mean like all right Chi Kung works is works great okay but you know I'm a personal being a personal trainer being an athlete I love my herbs okay <laughs> I love my reishi I love my uh, ginseng I love my um, uh, go to cola and you know uh, ginkgo bilbo 24% flavor side it seems to have a more stronger effect on me but then I also know that uh, there's certain um, Qigong I know acupressure works you get a toothache you hit certain acu you hit uh, certain acupressure points and knock it right out or a headache or something knock it right out as well but uh, you know for body bit from bodybuilding perspective you know we always exercise and then we use uh, er we use some um, food and also supplements in order to help to build our bodies and stuff up so I'm totally agreeing with y'all when y'all say um, it's an equal part you need the you need um the herbs uh in my case i like three treasure herbalism that's what ta uh, you know that's what i like to do uh tonic herbalism uh you know what that is right hon yes yes herbs are very powerful and uh, i use herbs uh, daily mm -hmm. uh, if i could just uh, say one thing yes. about traditional or classical chinese medicine it includes mm -hmm. um acupuncture it includes herbs, nutritional therapy, and qigong. Mm -hmm. And some would say it includes feng shui, you know, geomancy, mm -hmm. and um, Chinese astrology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let's t let's uh, set those aside for a minute, and I'll I'll exp I'll, I'll name the what I consider the five pillars of traditional or classical Chinese medicine. That's mm -hmm. uh, acupuncture. Uh, massage or body work, mm -hmm. herbs, nutrition, and qigong. Now, of all those five pillars, mm -hmm. which would you say was the most powerful and important? Uh, and uh, probably the answer would be they all equal, but I love my herbs. <laughs> Michael, what would you say? I'm going to say nutrition. Okay. Yeah, yeah, 80%. I can, yeah, yeah. Now you're 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 both um, correct, powerful modalities. But according to the uh, Taoist theory, the least powerful is acupuncture, because it's the most invasive, and you have to go to somebody else to get treated. Uh, unless you're an acupuncturist and and you can treat yourself and stick needles in yourself, you have to go to somebody else. So acupuncture is a way to move your energy around, move your chi around and rebalance your body. Again, most important and uh, powerful is body work. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing exercise, you can have and your energy around, you can have somebody else do it by uh, massaging, right? Okay, so somebody manually do it for you. Right. Now, herbs, uh, according to, to Taoist theory, is the third most powerful because it's directional and, um, and you don't necessarily have to go to somebody to uh, get the herbs. Of course, you have to go to a practitioner who, who would uh, prescribe herb form for you, but I'm sure that, Ma Malik, you probably have some uh, herbs or supplements that you take yourself mm -hmm, on a mm -hmm. daily basis and you don't really have to go to somebody. Mm -hmm. Now, nutrition is considered the next most powerful because it's not invasive you can do it yourself and just like the old adage what you eat is uh, what you are, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. foods are very powerful in Chinese medicine we use food as medicine mm -hmm. but the most powerful is what you can do for yourself every day mm -hmm. Is qigong mm -hmm. because it's non-invasive. You don't have to go to somebody else, and you can practice it every day on your own. And it p can potentiate all the other pillars. Not mm -hmm. only can it pot potentiate the pillars of Chinese medicine, but if you're taking Western meds, if you're taking uh, Western uh, pharmaceuticals, it can also potentiate the effects of those as well. 
so you can lower your dosage. Mm -hmm. And that's why the, uh, according to Taoist theory, Qigong is the most powerful medicine. And Qigong includes breath, uh, breath mm -hmm. we breathe, how we hold ourselves, posture and movement. But the most powerful of all of the Qigong modalities is meditation. Because it's how you quiet your mind. And as, as we demonstrated in the fingers growing gain, it's, it's what we tell ourselves and the messages we send to ourselves and how we heal ourselves and also help others heal. Okay, Han, let me make sure I got this right. So there are basically, there are like five pillars. Uh, and the five pillars, according to their um, order of importance um, or, or strength, is you said the first one is Qigong? Now, the, yeah, the first most powerful is Qigong. And that's the, and the, on that Qigong is the meditation or uh, st uh, the, um, the steel exercises. And then second that's is the moving, right? Exactly. Okay. Second is the herb. Um, second part of that is the herbalism. Now the next most powerful after Qigong is nutrition. Nutrition. Okay. Then we got nutrition. Which we eat every day. Okay. Things that we eat every day. What's the third? Third is uh, herbal medicine. Third is herbal medicine. What's the fourth? The fourth is massage. Fourth is massage, and the fifth is acupressure. Uh, acu acupressure, uh, actually acupuncture. Okay. Yeah, uh, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to uh, put myself out of business <laughs> because I'm an acupuncturist. But I'll tell you, uh, my goal is to help people help themselves. And that's why I always recommend all my patients practice Qigong. Right, right. So it's going to happen all your patients. To, and, that, and also Qigong helps people to keep their results too, right? Yes, yes. And that's the most exactly. important because we have a lot of people, they go into remission. I mean, they uh, whatever you call it, when the disease comes back. And a lot of times, I mean, you can do it. You can help pop people with the acupuncture and all uh, acupuncture and all that other type of, if they don't change their lifestyle habits, they have a tendency for those diseases and everything to come back. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And my my Qigong teacher, Master Chen Lin, who created Spring Forest Qigong, I mean, he's made tumors disappear. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, and that's yeah, how. It's really yeah. miraculous. Yeah, you know, with dealing with Reiki and um, I've, um, Reiki energy and stuff, I've um, I've actually seen stuff like that actually happen. So people have headaches, they disappear. Uh, people have pain in their jaw and everything that they disappear. The uh, most interesting, but you know, the tumor thing, I tell people, uh, people might get mad at me. I say Reiki is kind of like, like kindergarten because, you know, anybody can do it when they go through that. When you go through the Qigong or the, uh, any of the Qigong things, that's more going towards like college because you have to start, you have to exercise and you have to actually move your body on a regular basis and also you have to do something that's with it. And I definitely I find that to be very interesting. As a matter of fact, one of the head people of Spring Forest uh, Qigong is a Reiki master. The lady who is um, who actually uh, runs everything. You got Chun Li and you got the lady who does the advertising and stuff. You know who I'm talking about, huh? Uh, I'm not quite sure, but we do have a lot of uh, Reiki masters who uh, have taken Spring Forest and really like it. You know. Malik, I'm glad you mentioned Reiki because Reiki has a lot of uh, things that are very uh, simil similar to Spring Forest Qigong and all the energy work. They're all they're all, they're all good and they all have uh, shared common uh, elements to them. What I'd like to say about Qigong is that it involves not just um, healing yourself. Mm -hmm healing other people. Now in Spring Forest we have different levels of Qigong mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. highest level is really the spiritual level and and the, in the spiritual level we try to uh, connect with our soul purpose and to be become uh, radiators of love energy. That's what uh, Chen Yi Lin uh, espouses in his uh, philosophy of trying to have a healer in every family in a world without because uh, Chen Ni Lin says that the greatest power, healing power in the world is love, unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we radiate love, we affect everything and everyone around us. Mm -hmm. 
That's it. Mm. And then we become what we are. And in our reality, everybody becomes more loving as well. You know, it's like a tuning fork. When you have a lot of tuning fork, when you hit it, it begins to vibrate. And then when there's another tune, uh, another fork around there and it's the same as the other one, it begins to vibrate too. And uh, uh, the Bible basically talks about that, um, that humanity or God is made of love, light, and life. And therefore, being children of God, we also will love, light, and light. And what happens is, is when we have somebody who's very loving, that it's just like a tuning fork. It begins to radiate that's the love that's within each of us. And so the greater love that we have, the more we begin to radiate it and other people begin to resonate with ourselves. So that's why uh, a lot of people, they call charisma or something. It's because you're a great resonator. And when you have that love and that confidence and stuff, you make everybody else seem more loving and seem more confident and you begin to accomplish um, things that they want to do in life. Uh, what you have to say about that, Han? Oh, absolutely. I think we're, we're all connected in the universe. And the more chances we have to help other people, we're actually helping ourselves. I call it the boomerang effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that is the boomerang effect. But I guess... Uh, he called compassionate action. Anytime that we begin to do things for other people and the planet instead of ourselves, the um, Bible says there's no greater, no greater love than a person have than this, that they lay down their life for a brother. And a lot of people think that they actually sacrifice their life, but it goes a lot deeper than that. If you sacrifice your time, time is the greatest thing that any man can have. So when you sacrifice your time and for your brother, for the planet, for the people that you care about and everything. That really what happens is is that uh, you, you got like five levels of brain, five levels of uh, resonance within your mind. You got the beta level, which we're talking at. We got the alpha level, which we actually begin to think. We got the theta, which is one for um, childless pain, uh, childless, child, painless childbirth, or when you just don't feel pain at all. Then you have delta, which is sleep. And then we have what well, our body uh, rejuvenates itself while unconscious. And then we have what we call gamma level. Okay. And a very interesting thing that they found about the gamma level is the highest functioning of the human brain. Because we actually begin to connect with the universe. In which we be able to have inner, we be able to help to heal other people. To be able to help to heal situations. And they did a study on the Tibetan monks. And they actually found out that when they uh, when they go in their prayer and the particular prayers and stuff like that, they reach this particular gamma level of this gamma gamma level of mind, and they call it compassionate um, compassionate action for other people. That's why when people are so wrapped up in something that they love or something that they really care about, they can literally go days without eating or without sleeping, just focused on that one thing because they're so passionate about. It. It's because they literally hooked in into the energy of the universe. It's just like if they're sleeping, but they're awake. And I found that so amazing. That is uh, so uh, amazing. Uh, and when you mention compassion, Chin Yuen defines that as love and action. Mm -hmm. That is uh, doing things for other people. And uh, when you get into those meditative states and you get out of your own mind and out of your own ego and self, and try to be of service to other people. I think that is very powerful. One of the things I, I learned um, in my life uh, experiences uh, is to try... My One of my goals is to help wounded warriors because I was uh, in combat in Vietnam and uh, that's one of my big pet projects, so to speak, is to try to help wounded warriors uh, and their families. People who have served our country and have risked their life and limbs uh, serving our country. Uh, as I mentioned, I wrote, and all the profits from the sale of my book will be going to ch one or more charities that will benefit uh, servicemen who have been uh, either physically, spiritually, or emotionally. Mm -hmm. oh, that is okay. That's. The uh, tell me about some stories that you have. You actually worked with servicemen and helped them to get over their uh, Gulf War syndrome and their um, their depression and stuff more. Han. Yes, I provide free services to all uh, 
former uh, servicemen or uh, current servicemen or women who have been injured in the line of duty. And I also offer free classes, free Qigong classes to uh, these same individuals. Wow, that is super. Uh, could you give us your telephone number over the air, please, for some of the people who may want to call in who's listening now on that? Yes, it's 571-306-0533. Okay, can you say that one more time, please? Yes, 571-306-0533. Zero five three three. Okay, that's super. Could you give us of any example of the people that you've actually helped? Um, you don't have to give no names or anything. Just take us through one of the case works. Well, I'd like to tell you about uh, one particular individual, uh, and I'll mention by name because it's um, uh, Adrian, uh, who is, uh, and his wife Diana, who have formed a charity called Invisible Wounds, Invisible Wounds, and uh, Adrian, if you uh, go Invisible Wounds, you can uh, find these two individuals. Adrian was a uh, an army officer who, was, who suffers from PTSD, and his wife Diana, they've been real advocates for uh, getting help for veterans who are going through the trauma of war. Excuse me, hon. What's PBSD? Uh, PTSD, post-traumatic uh, stress uh, disorder. Wow, what is that? Well, that's when you uh, suffer from um, psychological and emotional trauma. It could be in, at war or it could be from rape or it could be in a, a car accident. But the veterans who come back from Iraq and Afghanistan, so many of them, uh, suffer from PTSD and um, brain injury. Mm -hmm. And so what happened with the uh, people? How did you help them? Well, I, I uh, use acupuncture and Chinese herbs and the most powerful thing is helping them to learn Qigong because in Qigong they don't have any of the side effects of uh, pharmaceuticals and it works because a lot of People can't come to acupuncture as often as I would like, but they can do Qigong every day on their own. Well, did it work? Yes, it helps people. And in fact, the Marine Corps and a lot of the services now are teaching veterans how to uh, do meditation. Okay. Not just people coming back, but people preparing to go uh, into combat zones because they can become more resilient and they can uh, uh, rebound, rebound, rebound faster, okay. recover faster. Super. Hey, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever dealt with anybody with post-traumatic uh, syndrome, PTSD? Oh, yeah. It's very common. Um, you know, a lot of, um, we hear a lot of it from the Gulf War. Um, people fought in um, Iraq. Afghanistan, places like that, but um, quite a few um, Vietnam veterans suffer from that, and I'm sure that um, any war, uh, people are unprepared for um, what's going to happen there. It's, it's not their normal concept, so it um, people, you know, come back to, um, you know, good old United States, and um, people have no concept of what's going on in these countries. And um, they can have all sorts of problems. They, you know, they can't sleep. Um, they can be very sensitive to noises. You know, a car backfires or something, and um, or in the middle of the night, you know, they they just wake up in sweats or heart pounding, things like that. Um, it's a it's a very serious problem, and um, I think you know um, the qigong is good, meditation is good, things like that. Acupuncture is good. Um, there's other, you know, experimental ways to um, to treat that. In fact, um, while we're talking about natural medicine, um, I read a number of years ago about an off-use, um, off-use um, label drug for a blood pressure medicine that helps people kind of um, um, eliminate those bad memories. Because basically, when you have a 
a horrific experience, and that could be in war or mm-hmm. it could be um, some sort of traumatic event in your life, like uh, maybe um, a woman is raped, a child molested, or um, serious accident, um, your adrenaline's flowing at that time. Mm-hmm. And it appears that the adrenaline kind of locks in those memories, you know, into your into your consciousness, and then no. then you mm-hmm. can't get it out. So if you think about your happy events in life, you know, birthday parties when you're a kid, or here's it's Christmas, you think about that, that's a happy event, too, and it's kind of locked in your memories. You can remember Santa Claus coming or something like that. Those are the good memories we want to have, but... <laughs> But if it's been a um, a war experience or a car wreck or um, a loss of a loved one in a, some sort of traumatic way, then it's locked in. And so, um, so there's like it's a blood pressure drug, and oh. it has to be yeah. um, prescribed by a, a psychologist. But um, but they've had some results with that in um, helping to eliminate that. And I think that there's a potential with acupuncture to do the same thing. As um, and though I don't have a training in psychology. Um, Basically, what you would do is um, you would use points that affect the spirit in acupuncture. Um, for example, there's a point Shen Men um, Han knows all these points, um, which is um, found on the wrist. Also, there's one on the ear. But um, but if you talk to people about these events and needle these points, um, I believe that you could possibly help release some of that. And it doesn't make you forget necessarily forget the memories, but um, it kind of releases that lock on the memory on those traumatic right, events so right. that you remember it but you don't have the I got you. the rapid heartbeat okay, or the Michael. panic the panic attacks associated Michael, with that. I understand that. Because you said every time that we have one of those traumatic experiences, what happened is is that adrenaline is increased that locks in that particular emotional moment, correct? Yeah, that's my understanding of it, yes. Okay, that's very interesting because emotional freedom technique uh, tapping, which is created by Gary Craig, actually uses acupressure uh, uh, acupressure techniques in order to do the same thing. So when they go back, do you know what um, emotional freedom technique is or EFT um, is, Han? Yes, it's a very powerful technique uh, created by uh, Gary Craig. And in fact, he, it gained uh, popularity because... Gary had started using it in um, with veterans mm-hmm, in veterans mm-hmm, hospitals mm-hmm, to help uh, veterans overcome PTSD, and he had amazing results. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've used it my I've used it myself as uh, to to try to help patients and show them how to do it because a lot of uh, my patients are needle phobic, there you go. and yeah. so they don't want to have uh, somebody sticking needles in them. But if I can show them a simple way that they can use at home, it, it really helps. So, you said this is what, oops, getting kind of echo, but this is what um, Michael had basically said is that, which kind of makes explains EFT to me, was that when you begin to re experience that, your adrenal gland or that adrenaline, and everything will go up. So, when you hit these points, when you hit these points, why you doing? Uh, why you associate it to that experience? I guess what what happen is it's your adrenal glands or adrenal what you call it will actually st- start to go back down, and it will unlock it, and that's maybe how EFT works. Well, I think it's also um, related in a way to qigong mm-hmm. because you're as you tap these points, which are at the ends or the beginnings of uh, channels. Mm-hmm. You're also uh, stating an affirmation. Right. You're going back to a memory, and you're um, stating an affirmation, where uh, whatever that affirmation is, mm-hmm. then basically you're sending a message, a message to your body, mm-hmm. rewiring and uh, the uh, mechanisms that created that that trauma. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I got me. Hey, thanks a lot, Michael. I got a new, I got a uh, new uh, knowledge and new information concerning that um, EF emotional freedom technique. So, um, that really, I didn't even know that. That your adrenal, that your body produces an adrenaline and it locks. That's very interesting for this guy. Yeah, it's kind of the key. Yeah, that's that's my understanding at least how it works. So, hmm. um, yeah, it's important. But like I said, you know, of course we we do have good memories, and that's. We do want to lock in the good memories, but mm-hmm. um, but it's the bad ones we want to 
somehow be able to release them to a certain extent. I'd like to say one other thing, too, is that um, I like to read about Chinese history a lot, and um, there's a book that's one of the oldest um, books in the world as far as having been written in book form, um, and it's in English. It's called Three Kingdoms, or San Guo Yan Yi in Chinese, and this is a story of the time period around 200 A.D., when China had split into three kingdoms, and you have um, some very fierce generals at this time. And without going into the story too much, um, well, one of them is Guang Gong, who we often see like in Chinese restaurants. He's like in a little altar. He has the big, the big sword. And um, he was elevated because of his fierceness to pretty much like an immortal standard. But, but in the story, what I find is interesting is that these men, they, they go in these horrific battles where you've got tens of thousands of people battling with swords and knives and what have you. And then um, oftentimes they cry in the story. They cry about <laughs> losing things. And so they're letting their emotions out. You know, they're not blocking them in. They, that's one way, too. And sometimes, you know, as men, um, we're taught, you know, not to cry. But sometimes it's, it's a good thing. You, you let those emotions out. You don't keep them in. You don't lock them up. So, um, but I thought that was real interesting about that story, because this goes back, like I said, the, the, the story goes back to 200 A.D., and the book, I think, was written around the 1200s or something like that. Mm -hmm. but, um, but just interesting about that, and I think, um, you know, it's a way you've, you've got to release these emotions and these horrors and things like that. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely, um, that's true, too. Um, Han, over here on the picture thing, we have a picture of, is that you jumping up? That's me. That's uh, when I was um, during my younger days, and that was taken in Washington D.C.'s Chinatown. Mm-hmm. So you say Chinatown was a rough place for you? Well, I grew up in New York's Chinatown. Uh huh. So uh, as a kid, I grew up there, and when I when I um, studied the martial arts, I started with uh, Japanese karate, mm -hmm. and uh, I continued the uh, Japanese and Okin st Okinawan styles in the Marine Corps. And it wasn't until I, I got to Washington, D.C. that I uh, returned to my Chinese roots and studied uh, Chinese martial arts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, just, to, okay. just to uh, get back to uh, the subject of emotions, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's one of the key things I, I've learned in my acupuncture practice is that we can resolve people's pain and symptoms, but they can reappear unless we address the emotional component. And oftentimes the root cause of an illness is uh, an emotional uh, an emotional one. Yeah, that's actually that's actually true. We found out that uh, most diseases or whatever, is due to uh, a stress or imbalance within the body and most of that is due to some type of emotional event and once we remove the stress the body can return back to its normal state of uh, normalcy or healing uh, of health so to speak so yeah you, that's why meditation is so beautiful is because it's like running a magnet over the entire body or returning back to zero again once a person hits the meditation you just simply let go of everything that's holding you back from becoming the type of person who that you already are inside you letting go of attachments you're learning how to let um let me go of the heavy burdens that are constantly uh keep uh topically holding you down like the albatross one around one's neck so that's why a lot of times when you come across these uh these iconical or archetypical masters and stuff a lot they seem so happy and wearing such a beautiful smile on their face it, although all the crap and stuff is going on all, uh, all around them they're wearing a smile why it's because they just let it go and let it be you know and a funny thing in life how we have a tendency to want to be worried about this and worried about that and worry is not helping you okay worry is not being proactive to helping you to achieve your goals in life nor to find a solution if you imagine that you are already where you need to be and if you imagine good thoughts you would attract the solution towards you and your unconscious whatever you focus on that's what grows if you focus on being worried and you focus on trouble that begins to be grow 
that begins to be manifest in life and also in your body. If you focus on health and you focus on the solution, that will grow. And when you when you begin to meditate, what happens is is that you because you, you already got the answer, you already know what path to or in order to uh, in order to walk. The problem is is that you can't see it. Okay, and when you begin to meditate, you begin to let these things go. It's like when you're trying to think of somebody's name and you keep on trying to remember, trying to remember and trying to remember, or you can't remember where you put something. When you let go, and you're just going about your business with a smile on your face. All of a sudden, it pops up. And that's what people need to be doing in life. You know, in the Bible, it says, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Regardless if you actually believe in God, Buddha, or whatever, it's a principle of detachment. Okay, cast your cares off to whoever you want it to. Okay, get it off you and just walk in life the beautiful person that you are, and that's what really living life is all about just focusing on uh, Dharma, focusing on your divine purpose in life, and to begin to fulfill it. And um, that's what you know, uh, uh, well, that's what meditation does for me, anyway. I try to maintain a, a meditative state, matter of fact. Deepak Chopra says is that when you have a compassionate um, Deepak, uh, Deepak, Deepak Pro Chopra says, y'all know who Deepak is, right, Michael? Yes. Okay. Oh, yes. yes. Okay. He says in his very first one um, on on uh, on his uh, seven spiritual laws of success, on the law of potentiality, about maintaining any time it's instead of meditation, if you just have a compassionate. Uh, action towards other people you'll be at the same level as meditation okay so if you want to continually meditate just do nice stuff for other people okay that's great yeah you can't be you can't be worried about other people's uh, you can't be worried about your your own junk or own stuff that's going on in your own life when you're out here helping other people okay I love that yeah, yeah. So I find that I find that to be very interesting. That's the spiritual seven spiritual laws of success by Deepak Chopra. The very first one is uh the, the very first one is the law of potentiality, where you have compa uh, meditation on a daily basis. Your number one, he got it from the Course in Miracles is for today. I will not judge. Okay, that'll put you in a meditative state. Second state one is is continually meditate on a continual basis, one hour a day plus. And the third thing is just com completely just live a compassionate life. If you do either of these three things, you begin to access your uh, who you are as an individual and begin to manifest your true potential in life. And that's why I love my show so much because I'm doing what I love, you know. And um, my uh, producer, he like he can't understand why one way I'm one uh, say when I'm out in public I act one way when I'm here I'm just like totally confident. It was, I don't care who I talk to. Okay, <laughs> it's because I'm happy about what I'm doing, and it's the same way with you, right, Michael? You are happy about what you're doing, right? Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's not like going to work. It's you know doing what you like. Yeah, it's bliss. What about you, hon? You like what you're doing? Oh, absolutely, and I agree uh, totally with what you just said. Yeah, that's so cool. That's why you got out of the CIA, huh? You wouldn't fall in your bliss. Well, I enjoyed my time in the CIA. I think um, all the paths I've traveled have actually led me to my end goal. Each was a stepping stone. Yeah, I think that is uh, too. But I think also, uh, Han, that you bring more to the table from your perspectives than um, what you presently um, just do. You see, my whole thing, especially about having you on the show, is is that you, what is your, as you you are a master healer. There are not, but you are also a CIA op, used to be a CIA operative. They got a lot of master healers out there, okay. But you're the only one I know that used to be a CIA operative. And I'm like, all right, if you combine the both of those together, Han. What type of mentality or what type of contribution would that actually bring to the world? And my idea, you know about uh, the things, how that what's going on in Afghanistan, what's going on here in America, what's going on in Japan and all that other type stuff. How would you uh, help healers or how would you help the planet if, if, we, if somebody was to put you as a senator or in control or position of some type of power with what you knew with the CIA and together with your uh, what you know as far as healing and everything how would you make the world a better place 
I think if there are commonalities in what I did at the CIA or yeah. even when I was a, a Marine and leading men in, in Vietnam or as a martial arts instructor and now as a uh, acupuncturist and healer, mm -hmm. that commonality is about connections with people, mm -hmm. knowing people and gaining their trust and confidence. And in gaining the trust and confidence and making the connection, it's all about uh, helping others. So in helping others and in helping my patients, uh, they're not going to allow me to help them change whatever emotional, physical, or spiritual patterns that may be uh, troubling them unless they trust me, unless they have confidence in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So throughout my career, whether it was in the military or in civilian life, I've tried to develop the, the ability to connect well with others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think it's okay. so important in, in any profession, but especially the healing profession. Okay. Well, let's say, Han, I'm going to make you the president of the United States. Okay. And what would you do? Yeah, I'm going to make you the president of the United States of everything that you learned. Okay. Uh, right now, you're the president of the United States. What changes would you make? as far as making this, um, making the world a better place? Well, first of all, I resign and I, uh, <laughs> I believe, take, take over my duties. I, uh, okay, so, okay, you want to, what you call it, the question. All right, I'm going to put it like this. If I was president of the United States and I had CIA experience and I was also a master healer, I would team up with uh, Master Chun Li Lian and make sure that Spring Tree Forest Qigong was taught in every high school as a, a prerequisite in order and and one of the reasons that that would be was because in order to right now we got down with Obamacare with everybody you know if they get sick they have to use their insurance whatever but if we're practicing spray forest Qigong Tibetan medical Qigong or whatever I think we could probably and you already said it yourself that the number one thing on the pillars is the Qigong is, uh, is the Qigong movements and stuff that we do is first is Qigong second is um uh second is the herb uh, second is nutrition uh, second is herbs uh, second is nutrition yes second is nutrition third is the herbs uh fourth is what again uh, body work and massage. Fourth is body work and massage, and fifth is acupuncture. So I'll be teaching. I I make sure it's a prerequisite that that would be taught at all the high schools for everybody to learn how to treat themselves in order to stay healthy. Okay, and that would bring the uh, health care and everything down a lot because everybody be doing preventive measurements instead of uh, preventive measurement or preventive things from getting sick in the first place. So it wouldn't be so much money taken out of of the economy and other stuff to uh out of the government so we can actually put that towards other things also what i'd like to do um as president of the united states is to find uh those people find those people out there who have a potential to be like a master chun li lian um even like i hate to be what you call like that but i believe just like um I I people who got sick I believe th there are rich people out there who got billions and trillions of stuff dollars uh, d dollars out there. I mean, he got a lot of money. Now, what if you could find somebody, and, you know, I'm not trying to be blasphemous or anything, that could heal like Jesus, okay? Jesus laid his hands on the sick, and, you know, they recover blind eyes, see the ears, what you call it, all that other type stuff. And I believe just like you have prodigies out there, people, you can give mathematical problems, they can do it in their heads, and they know, like these kids who know eight different languages and all that. You got pro you got uh, prodigies, ch child prodigies out there in these third world countries, uh, in Mexico, over there in India, when they have the uh, what you call it, the millionaire, the slum, the slum dog millionaire. You got people over there. I would have programs in place that they can practice spring forest qigong, and if they turn out to be super, uh, superb, uh, superb uh, healers. You know, uh, the renowned healers, not only be able to heal their families and everyone around them, but have these multi-millionaires, these rich people, to be able to sponsor them to come here to the States or wherever that is. Now, why is that so important? That a person can buy, these millionaires uh, can buy anything in the world that they want except their health. Am I right? Am I, am I right, Michael? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, except their Am I right? Am I right, Han? 
Yes, and I'm glad I made you uh, president. <laughs> and this is what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> and this is what I'm saying with this is though is that what you just had was a gate. So whoever just died, this rich dude just died of a disease a few years back. Uh, you know, as a job, Steve Jobs died of something, right? Cancer or something. Yeah. Okay, yeah. now imagine if we had somebody like a Jesus, okay? We might actually have somebody who's the most powerfulest person, which God, and Jobs has somebody like that on their staff, okay, to come up and cure him of disease. I'm trying to tell these rich people out here, they are, there are people out here like that, who's genetically like that. Just like you got people who's able to do the math, calculate the math, and uh, you can just give them these numbers and they can do it in their head. You got kids who can lift just as much as an adult because of their genetic potential or run faster and all this, learn eight languages and all this. Other. You got these child prodigies out here. So here you are. You're sick. You are sooner or later you're going to sick. That you're going to be sick. And no matter type, no matter what type of medical stuff that you, uh, medical hospitals that you go to or whatever, they won't be able to heal you. Now you got over there in these third world countries, no here, and also here in America, you got people. These children are dying every day. But not only are they dying, but the, your solution to your problem, to your sickness or future sickness, is dying also. And if we could take spring forest qigong to these third world countries and have them to practice with the uh, with the intention that if they do real good at this and they get real good at this and earnestly, because the very first thing that happens is Han. According to Master Chun again, is that he always get on his students about practice? Am I right? Yes, and I'm glad you uh, mentioned about uh, getting people to getting these child prodigies to learn how to be healers, because Chun Lin says that everyone is born a healer. Mm -hmm. So you know, just because uh, I hold a title of master healer, that doesn't mean that. Uh, other people can't do it. Everybody has the potential <laughs> to help themselves heal and to help other people heal. That is the truth. And let me tell you what. Uh, three. A funny thing happened to me because I'm a Christian. Okay, I had uh, um, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm Pentecostal or whatever. But I had this lady who used to be um, with my best friend's mom. She had cancer, and for some reason, I was. And they didn't tell me this, and for some reason, God, Lord, whoever you like to say. Uh, told me to drop by the house and I said I'm here to help you okay and I prayed for them I prayed for them and the next day she didn't have she went she went to the hospital whatever she didn't have cancer anymore okay so I know and her um my best friend his name is Marcus or whatever and he just asked me about that but this is what I did as a child and the what get me about this hunt is basically this if I had a healing program or something that was in place back during that time maybe my life would be a little bit different I think that there are there are probably are people who there's children out there who can if they had that type of technique or, or if they had the systems and stuff in place there could be a real benefit to it to the society but let's face it there's just not no money into it now that's why I bring up the fact is, is that if we can have, we says, hey, Mr. Steve Jobs, if you invest in this uh, Spring Forest Qigong program, we can go find these kids or people who have a natural talent for healing and put them earnestly into the program in order that when you get sick or something, we'll have we'll have them there on staff to be able to help you. Now, a lot of time, a lot of times in China, what they had basically was is that they have groups of healers come together in order to help heal people. Have you heard of that, Han? Well, you know, Qigong was uh, really big in China, unfortunately, because of the politics. Mm -hmm. A lot of the Qigong programs that were uh, sponsored uh, by the state are no longer um, no longer getting the research money that they used to get. It used to be that Qigong was um, part of the curriculum in uh, the traditional uh, could you hold on one minute? Chinese medicine. Yes, could you hold on? All right, everyone, we're about to go off the radio. If you want to listen to the rest of this, please uh, look at the video, and we'll take it from there. Okay, go ahead. So, unfortunately, the uh, state sponsorship of uh, and research devoted to Qigong is no longer as it was. Yeah, I know. And you see, and that's what made me so mad about that because, you know, we're here in America, so I can actually talk about this. It was the advent of Falun Dafa or Falun Gong during that time. It became so, you you know about that, right? Exactly. 
Okay, that what happened is because one of the things that the fallen doffer actually preached about was about truth, compassion, and forbearance. And they had so many people getting healed in that particular in that particular program. So many people uh, having positive uh, change, their lives being transformed or whatever. They weren't hurting people and all of it. The, the government or whatever didn't like that because a lot of their high-ranking people were involved in that because it became life transformational and this is this is the, this is the problem on is basically this is that uh the qigong exercises is definitely a threat to the established um to um to the establishment because instead of being dependent upon them in order to get healed we become dependent upon ourselves Okay, and that from a CIA, CIA perspective, I, I mean, what you think about that? Well, I don't want to get into the politics of it. I and think it's uh, pretty drama. complicated. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the Falun Gong movement was um, was based in Taiwan, and as you know, Taiwan mm -hmm. and uh, the people on the mainland have uh, mm -hmm. their political differences. Gotcha. Unfortunately, the Falun Gong movement was actually a political movement that was um, was corrupted mm -hmm. to some extent mm -hmm. because of that. I know, and isn't that so, what? But in China, people are still doing qigong. Mm -hmm. uh, they can still get, but the main thing is that it, it isn't uh, officially. It doesn't get the funding that it used to get. The research money. Right, and that's why I'm so. Uh, that's why I'm so focused on about having, or uh, if any people listen to this is about finding child prodigies or whatever because i say it, it's all most of it's all related to money and if i tell a person who's uh if i tell a person the rockefellers and um the uh, whoever else is what you call it out there it says hey we got people we got talent around here a talent a talent around the world right now that can heal just like jesus we just got to find him and train him but you know the whole thing about it is you know i mean I'm just saying metaphor metaphorically speaking, okay? And right now and there are places all over the world right here that kids are actually dying. They need food to eat on a regular basis, you know? And I'm like, hey, we can offer them Qigong. We can offer them a way out. And they will diligently and I mean diligently practice these hip meditative and healing exercises on a daily basis and they do whatever that they need to do in order to get them out of the situation we handing them chi kong in order for them to get out of the situation that they're in by becoming a better person does that sound like a good idea Han? oh absolutely and that's one of the reasons why i like uh Trini lin's philosophy of a healer in every family exactly. in a world without pain and he's trying to do that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, uh, as an acupuncturist i can only heal one patient at a time <laughs> but if I can teach one person qigong and then that teach other people then we can get a whole community of healers exactly and that's what I'm focused on hey um Michael did was you interested in studying uh a chi uh, qigong right that's what you were saying in the um in the last video I was um interested in it yeah I, I have studied a little bit of qigong um but I haven't um, been persistent in, in practicing, let me put it that way. But over the years, I've taken um, a number of classes. There was um, a very well-known um, Dallas priest in California who used to come up to our area, and um, he would teach. And so I took classes with him a number of times, and um, but unfortunately, I never kept it up. <laughs> But um, I, I would just like to comment, though, one thing about your your, your comment about um, finding finding like children who could be trained and, and put back in their communities. And um, Cuba actually has a, a program with doctors where they do that. They find um, people in poor countries and they sponsor their education as medical doctors. And these people have ties to their community, and um, they go through the medical training. They you know these people come from like you know, dirt hovel schoolhouses and they end up being medical doctors, but then they go back in their community and they they love their communities and they want to help them. And um, anyways, what you were talking about reminds me of this. It's like training people and putting them back into their communities where they have a tie, which would be um, very valuable. Yes, and that's what um, Master Chun Li Yen wants. He wants a healer in every family in a world without pain, right? Exactly. 
Yeah. So, I mean, he's talking about, huh, I'm looking at your, uh, when I'm looking over here, in Chinatown, you was actually, it was an interracial um, uh, brotherhood, wasn't it? It was. Now, when I grew up in New York's Chinatown, mm -hmm. um, we, it was a self-contained community, but I went to uh, junior high school in a, in a mixed neighborhood. We had blacks and Puerto Ricans and uh, uh, East European, so it was a melting pot. New York, as you know, is a melting pot, and I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I definitely I can see that. I like that. That's probably helped you a lot in, um, when you was in the CIA as far as, um, you know, interlating with um, different people and stuff. Now, you also study a martial arts style called Jiao Gao. Uh, what is that specifically? Yes, Jiao Gao is a hybrid system. It's com comprised of uh, two southern systems and one northern system. It, uh, so it's a pretty, pretty powerful uh, form of uh, martial arts. Super. So you got Hungar, which is the strength, and then you got the Choga, which is the uh, leg evasion, foot evasion. Right. So the two southern, southern styles are Hungar. We took the most powerful hand techniques from Hungar. Uh, Choi Ga is also a southern style. We took quick footwork from Choi Ga, and then we took the long-range kicking and jumping techniques from northern Shaolin, mm -hmm. and we combined them all. It was started by a guy named uh, Zhao Long, mm -hmm. and he was the uh, tramp for one of the deputy uh, commanders in uh, Guangdong province. Uh, the army and he helped train uh, army troops. This was in the early 1920s. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, who is this guy oh. right here? Okay, this is the uh, father of my present Mizong uh, style uh, martial arts instructor. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is uh, Lu Zhen Do, and he was very uh, for his, uh, they called him. Lightning Hands Lu, because mm -hmm. he could knock out opponents in an all-out uh, all brawl, sort of like mixed martial arts. He could knock them out with just one, one uh, palm strike to the chest. Wow. So what form is he using right here? He is, pr uh, he is practicing Mizong uh, Shaolin martial arts. Okay. All right. Never heard of that one. What does Mizong mean? Yes, Mi Zong has many interpretations, but uh, in our system, it means uh, secret Buddhist sect art. Hmm. Now, another interpretation is a lost track art. Okay, It's a combination of Bagua, Xing Yi, which is, which is the internal styles, which I know you know about, mm -hmm. Tai Chi, mm -hmm. and also Northern Shaolin. So it has both internal and external. Hmm, interesting, as far as that goes. Hmm, and his form is good, too. Look at that. Hmm. Oh, so yeah, he, he's most, uh, he's very well known for his uh, sword play. Uh -huh. he, um, he taught the Qingping uh, sword, which is the crown jewels of Chinese swordsmanship. Mm hmm wow. Okay, and what's his name again? Lu Zhen Duo, and he's the father of my teacher, Lu Junhai. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, um, let me ask you a couple of y'all questions. When y'all performing uh, acupuncture on people, is there a difference between, you know, y'all both know what fascia is, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is there a difference in the density of the fascia or, also, or the skin texture for those who practice internal martial arts versus those who does external exercises? That I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that one. Yeah, the fascia, the fascia is different for uh, people who do the martial arts, especially the in internal styles. I, I believe that's what you're alluding to. Is yes. that correct, Malik? Mm -hmm. Because uh, some martial arts masters, they can uh, control the uh, fascia in their lower abdomen, in the what we call the Dantian area, mm -hmm. so that they can actually absorb uh, blows and actually, when you when you hit the uh, martial arts master, 
in the in the lower abdomen, they their their fascia is such that it's so flexible and pliable. Yeah, that, that they're they able can to bounce. Ward off the blow and bouncy that's very interesting but that's also a very interesting thing that's how when they be doing um when you be doing pressing um the pressing ward you see the one where the a student comes at the uh instructor and then he bounces him or uh projects them like many feet away yes that's uh what we call fa jing yes or the uh, expression or um the power yeah. Now, my whole thing about that, because, you know, me being a personal trainer, I always got to try to figure out. My thing is that the fascia is a lot more thicker in those particular areas. And that is, that is one of the things that go behind projecting somebody so far. It's just like taking a bamboo stick and you bring it back and then you let it go. So you got these instruct and you let it go and they go wham. So a lot of times when you have these people coming at you, you got your your tendon ligament development and also your fascia is so just like I as a personal trainer, I develop my muscles to get big. These internal martial artist people instead has developed their fascia, tendons and ligaments and also their bones to become just as powerful as what their muscles are so that even if you look at them, they may not look as strong, but because of their link their connection to that muscle those um, are so thick that when you press they're able to express that muscle they're able to express force a lot more what you think about that Han? yeah I think that's uh, very true and uh, if you look at Bruce Lee mm -hmm. uh, he, he didn't have the build I mean he had a good uh, structure but he didn't have the build of uh, you know Mr. America mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he had uh, very strong uh, muscles and tendons and ligaments. But but when he exerted force, it wasn't just uh, from the uh, from the arm, one inch punch. But it was a whole body uh, force. Right. So everything was driven from the from the ground up, and it was so well synchronized and coordinated that he was able to harness mm -hmm. all his strength into uh, a very uh, small compact area and throw his opponents who weighed two or three times more than he did several feet in the air and yes and yeah, that was also it now uh, Michael and Han are you familiar with the book called The Anatomy Trains please I'm, I'm not um, I think I've I think I've seen the title, but um, no, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Now, the book called The Anatomy Trains, and I challenge both of you to pick it up and read it in order for you to understand. understand. It may bring some more light to your uh, internal martial arts training. Now, what this guy basically did was that they um, dissected. They were dissecting people, okay? And he, what he found out that there's fascia or wet suit that actually goes over every muscle in the entire body. Now, you know what a wetsuit is like when you're swimming, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when he finds it out, when he cuts it sideways, it's like he got skin on the uh, chicken or whatever like that, which is fascia. We also have skin that's also on our muscle. That is just like when we put, when we lift in weights, we put on a belt in order to help to increase your strength. Well, this fascia, it does the same thing. Okay, it keeps everything in pl it keeps everything in place. But the thicker that this fascia becomes, the more compact or the more energy that you be actually be able to get from um, these muscles from the coordination of all the muscles together. Okay, so I found out that to be very interesting. Now I was mentioning that because of arm uh, arm body training because with developing the arm body you can actually develop the fascia on these muscles to the extent that they'll be able to better uh, that you'll be able to better to absorb blows and this is from the study of the anatomy trains and I definitely ask y'all both to look into that all right people we got about five more minutes and I, I definitely I love uh, talking um, talking to you also you have your own both of you you have your own clinics this is your acupuncture place uh, correct John Yes, this is uh, my acupuncture clinic. I call it the Sports Edge Acupuncture. I, I use the term Sports Edge. Now, a lot of my patients kind of wonder why I called it Sports Edge. It's uh, to pay homage to my martial arts teachers who mm -hmm. were uh, Chinese medicine practitioners. But I actually treat all kinds of different things from acne to uh, stroke and infertility. 
Ah, okay, that's super. Also, uh, here's a picture of yourself um, when you was here at the CIA. Yeah, that's me standing at the lobby. I was uh, it was during my retirement ceremony, and my wife is by my side along with my two daughters. Okay. All right. Um, Okay, all right, and this is the picture of Chun Li Yen. Yeah, this is a picture with me and my uh, Qigong master Chun Li Lin, and we're in uh, Minnesota. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm okay, that's cool. Yeah, he's. I always wanted to study under him. Is he just as powerful in person? Uh, he's even more so, and what I like about him is he's really a humble person, and he he walks the talk. Yeah. And uh, what I also like about him and what, what resume, resonated with me is that he's well-versed in Chinese medicine, acupuncture, all the pillars of Chinese medicine, but also uh, Chinese uh, geomancy and feng shui and uh, astrology. Okay, that's absolutely good. All right, we're going to, um, we got about three more minutes. I'm going to... Um uh, actually, do y'all have any parting comments or anything that y'all like to say? Um, I'll start off with you, Michael. Yeah, the, um, the conversation, we this was a good conversation and, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I would like to go on again. But um, one thing when Han discussed the five pillars of Chinese medicine is that's kind of like the five pillars of, of health care, too, mm -hmm. because that's how we can start taking care of ourselves um, through meditation, um, um, you know, qigong, nutrition, herbs, massage, acupuncture, but the rest of the world takes it another level, which is into um, more external medicine, which is they're getting pharmaceutical drugs, they're going for surgery, x-rays, chemotherapy, things like that, and that's a very, very um, far out extreme. So if we make a continuum of all those things from meditation to say, surgery and chemotherapy, we want to stay on the end where we're doing the meditation, nutrition, herbs, exercise, things like that, and not get out on that farther end. And I think that's been the focus of our discussion today, too, is to, to um, taking care of ourselves, learning how to do qigong, or, or the importance of taking care of ourselves and, and living a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And yourself, Han, any parting comments? Well, Malik, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be on your show. I thank Michael for uh, your remarks, and uh, I want you to continue to do what you're doing to spread the word and to help uh, make a healer in every family in a world without pain. And happy holidays to you and, and all the people in, uh, in the audience. All right. That's uh, definitely super. Now, would y'all both like to come back? Um, you know what Dit Dow is, Han? Oh yes, and I may I brew my own. Okay, would you be interested in, sh in sharing your secrets over the radio? Absolutely. Okay, what about you, um, Michael? You you do dit dow? I do, yeah, yeah. Okay, would you be interested in sharing your secrets over the air? Sure. Okay, yeah. so what I'm going to do is I'm trying to get some people for to put together a dit dow video. And the reason that I'm doing that is just a reference for people just to come back and to watch the video and we can get exchange information and stuff. So we're looking I'm looking for that. Please hold on for after the show. Uh don't hang up both y'all. We'll be chit chatting. And uh my name is Malik L Train. This is Health Awareness Talk. Uh, again, we have um, Han K. Lee of uh Sports Edge Acupuncture Clinic and we also have um uh Mitchell Chitowski here of East Earth Herbals, uh, East Earth Trade uh, Herbal Company. And all y'all out there, please have a wonderful night and see you soon. Thank you.